mainly on the two dimensional covalent organic frameworks. Uh, once again, I'm really thankful for the Pakistan Membrane Society to give me this opportunity. So I am Niaz Ali Khan. I did my PhD from University of Strasbourg. Uh, I did my master from University of Mumbai, as Professor Yunus said. And currently I'm working in School of Chemical Engineering and Technology, Tianjin University. Uh, this school is the top school in in China since I think three or four years. So it is the A plus school in, in China. Uh, in this webinar, I will try to give a little bit introduction about membrane, how it works, uh, about polyamide membranes, and then we will go slowly towards the framework membranes. So first we will talk about the membrane's usefulness in industrial processes. Then the very popular integrally skinned asymmetric membranes and thin film composite membranes. Now, uh, frankly speaking, I was a little surprised that not too many people are working in Pakistan on thin film composite membranes. These membranes present a lot of opportunities, which I will discuss in later slides. So thin film composite membranes, they have few challenges. I will not talk about all of them, but for example, low flux and fouling and how to address these challenges. So the first way to do it is decreasing thickness or addition of fillers, as Professor Yunus said, mixed matrix membranes. So these represent a better opportunities. And at the end, I will also talk about the two dimensional materials such as graphene oxide, covalent organic frameworks and the three-dimensional conjugated microporous polymers. Uh, as, you all as you all are familiar with the membrane status currently, so only membranes for reverse osmosis are currently applied in large-scale applications. The other membranes, they are still at their very primary stages. There are many challenges for membrane technology to replace the other separation processes. Challenges means opportunities. So if there are large challenges, there are large opportunities for the researchers. The first big problem in membrane technology is the trade-off between selectivity and permeability. If we increase one, we decrease the other one and vice versa. So how to solve this problem? The second problem is fouling. The third is material instability. So some materials, for example, graphene oxides, they are not stable in aqueous solution. Other materials, they are not stable in organics solvents. So we have to think about making membranes which are stable. For membranes, uniform pore distribution is of the utmost importance. So how to make membranes with uniform pore distribution? Low cost, large scale application and long term durability. All these are challenges faced by membrane technology currently. So I don't need to, to, to present to you this slide, but just how membranes work. So membranes are porous material or it is a barrier in which there is a feed and there is a permeate. So in the feed, there is usually a solvent and a solute. Or and the other, other side of the membrane should represent permeate. That's how we purify things. The larger, the larger molecules whose size it then the pore size of the membrane, they are retained. Really they are solvents. They can permeate through the barrier, which is called membrane. So the potential usefulness of membranes in industrial processes. So as you all know that in industries, a large amount of uh, cost is paired on the separation of solvent from the solute or recovery or disposal of uh, 
uh, unwanted material. So it cost a significant amount of capital on the operating processes. How membrane can be useful? So I have summarized it in three uh, subheadings, concentration, solvent exchange, and purification. So concentration, you can say that we can concentrate either a solvent or we can concentrate either a solute. So it depends on what we, what we want. In some industries, the organic, uh, organic solvent is important. So we have to recover that organic solvent. So if we have a membrane and this organic solvent has some impurity, so the membrane can retain the impure uh, product and we can get the solvent recovery. Solvent can be uh, concentrated on the permeate side of the membrane or vice versa. We can also enrich the solute, uh, for example, a dye or a pharmaceutical product, etc. The other uh, part in industries where membrane can be useful is solvent exchange. So as we all know that some molecules, they are stable in one solvent and they are not stable in another solvent. So in chemistry, we usually separate these by, by the separating funnel. But for separating funnel, we need two solvents to be immiscible. So what if the solvents are miscible? How do we, how do we, transfer the, the molecule which we need from one solvent to another. So it's called dye filtration. So in this diagram, as you can see, the first solvent is a green, the color is green and there is a, a, a molecule which we need, a product which we need, but this product may be unstable in the green solvent. So how to remove this product from the green solvent in the system uh, characteristic should but retain the other. This way we get the product from one solvent to another solvent. So here the product is in the green solvent but the product is not stable in this solvent. Through membrane we can introduce the pink, just the color of another solvent to, so we can pour this solvent here and the green solvent can go out through membrane and now the product is stable in the new solvent. So this is another area where membrane can work in the industries. And the other one is purification. So as we all know that membranes can be classified with different properties, but let's say here we are talking about the molecular weight. So if there are two dyes, one is brilliant blue, the molecular weight is 826, the other is yellow dye, basic yellow, let's say, the molecular weight is 273.3. So if we have a membrane which can allow basic yellow and can retain brilliant blue, we can easily separate these two dyes from each other just by dye filtration. So these are the three simple processes in industries in which membrane can be uh, used. Perhaps the most advertised of, of the most exaggerated or and is that it's environment friendly operation. What does it mean? It means that it needs less energy than the current uh, currently available separating processes let's say distillation. So if we want to distill one liter of water, it will need an energy of 1750 megajoule. If we do the same separation through a membrane, we need just a pump and a pressure. What is the energy needed? Just three megajoules. So the difference is huge. That's why we, call, we say that membrane is the operation of membrane is environment friendly. It is energy friendly. You can see the difference. Actually in this PowerPoint, I had made a video. I had copied a video rather of Professor A.G. Livingston in which he 
shows this through a bike and he runs a bike and then distill water and then he runs a bike and he uses the membrane but i removed it because of the time shortage you can find it very easily on youtube so how we how we say this membrane is good and of the criteria one is called flux or permeance uh, some people confuse it flux is just a random number without mentioning the pressure i prefer permeance because permeance is always per bar so it's very easy to compare in some papers i see that they say the flux increased from 12 to 60 but we don't we have to search what is the pressure they used so permeance is a better term because we already know if it's a 12 it means per bar so either we say flux or permeance or the rejection and selectivity in the beginning i said there is a always a trade-off currently in the membrane to increase the flux we decrease the rejection or selectivity and vice versa and this formula you all know that how to calculate the rejection of or selectivity uh, uh, for salts we usually use conductivity test uh, of the feed and the permeate for dyes we usually use the uv test so we run the feed solution through uv and then we run the in the permeate solution through uv and by absorbance uh, we, we can calculate what is the rejection of dyes so let's talk about this membrane because these are very popular membrane and they are ultra filtration membrane if you if you know PES, polyether sulfur, polyacrylonitrile membrane, they all are made through this process. So in this process, there is one membrane, but there are two layers. And the top layer is actually the active layer, while the bottom layer has more pore. The top layer is very thin. How it is made, the technique is called phase inversion technique. So what we do, we make a solution of the polymer in an organic solvent. Then we spread it through a glass plate. And when you spread this glass plate in water, because water is anti-solvent. So organic, organic solvent, the polymer is soluble in organic solvent. But when you put this thin layer in water, it, the water is anti-solvent. So it re-precipitates the polymer. So what happens that the top layer is found very suddenly so there is more polymer on the top layer and in once the top layer is formed the the diffusion of water is slowed down so when little water goes down then there is a porous structure where there is more voids or cavities and less polymer to show you this method uh, i think i need to change it I don't know how to how to play this video. Wanted option. Oh yeah. So let's let's see here. So this is a polymer solution in organic solvent and they will spread it on this glass. And here we buy phase inversion method. It's as simple as that.
So as I said, two layers are formed. One is the top layer because the water, the water can diffuse very quickly on the top layer. So once the top layer is formed, then the bottom layer is formed. And the bottom layer provides just the support. Uh, there are large cavities and pores, whereas comparatively in the top layer, the pore size is smaller. But still, usually these membranes are ultrafiltration membrane, and the pore size ranges from 50 nanometer to one micron. Then there is another type of membranes, and these membranes are more popular than the integrally skinned asymmetric membrane. They are called thin film composite membranes. Uh, this field is already how I can say that the, this field or these membranes are all still challenges. So the if I if I if it is made for the sodium chloride rejection, the permeance is zero point seven to one. That's quite low. And the next problem is fouling. So how these strategies can be, can be, uh, sorry, uh, how these challenges can be addressed. So the first one is to decrease the thickness of active film or increasing free volume or addition of fillers. We will, we will talk about it one by one. So this, how these membranes are made. So we take, an ultrafiltration membrane which has already been made by the phase inversion technique and then we make another thin layer on top of this membrane for example polyether sulfur or polyacrylonitrile uh, or pvdf many many uh, uh, supports so first uh, uh, a monomer an amine monomer which is soluble in water we dip this support in that monomer, the amine bearing monomer, which is usually in the aqueous solution. Then we remove it, remove the water droplets. Then we put this membrane in uh, an organic solvent. Normally it's hexane and the monomer is uh, trimethyl chloride. Some people call it TMC, they ha it has many names. And then a very thin barrier around 50 to 100 nanometer, it is formed on top of the ultrafiltration membrane. And this is the membrane which is used for the reverse osmosis processes. So thin film composite membrane is actually a type of a class of membrane which are used currently in the industries for reverse osmosis or desalination purposes. So these two layers, we already talked about it and we make a new layer of around 100 nanometer, which is in most cases, it is the polyamide layer on top of this ultrafiltration membrane. And that, that top layer functions versus osmosis layer. Now, as I said, the permeance or flux of these membranes is extremely low. It's around 0 0.7 to 1. But in next 10 years, the, the demand for clean water will be too much. And with this flux, we cannot fulfill the demand. So we have to think about how to increase the permeance or flux, but at the same time, we have to keep the rejection or selectivity of the membrane. So two methods, one is freestanding membrane. The other one is uh, to make a thin membrane and how to make a thin membrane by lowering the diffusion rate of a mean bearing monomer from aqueous to organic phase. So this is one example where Professor Andrew G. Livingston, they first, they for the first time made a freestanding polyamide membrane. So they observed that when the thickness of the membrane decreases, the permeance increases. So at 16 nanometer, the permeance is below one, but around seven nanometer, the permeance is three, above three. So that's three, more than three times higher than the original permeance. What they do, 
they make a freestanding membrane in a glass funnel or petri dish and then transfer this membrane to different supports it depends you use uh, pbdf you use pes or it depends on what kind of application you want because some supports by support i mean the ultra filtration membrane support they are not stable in one solvent they are not stable in another solvent so it depends on which kind of support you use for application orientation so recently our group we did another method and here uh, i will introduce covalent organic framework in a little while but here what we did on the polyether sulfone support we made a super hydrophilic layer of covalent organic framework nanosheets so first we made covalent we synthesized covalent organic framework through salvothermal method and then we exfoliate that covalent organic framework or COF into nanosheets then deposit those nanosheets on the pes support now when this pes support is dipped in the amine bearing monomer it functions as a storage container so here this orange color thing is cof nanosheets and this is a pes support so we first deposit the cof sheets on the PS support vacuum and once this cough is super hydrophilic so that it can be stored inside the pores right come in contact with this cough and paparazine support because this is a storage container so the cough are inversely proportional if a membrane is thick the flux is low if a membrane is thin the flux is high so we could make a membrane as low as 10 nanometer thickness Why, whereas without cough the membrane thickness is about 100 nanometer so 10 times uh, thinner membrane we could make by introducing cough nanosheets on the pes support so here you can see that the rejection of sodium sulfate remains unchanged for all of our membranes but the permeance increases dramatically so one means one percent of cough two means two percent three four you can so at five percent of cough the flux increases from 160 to around 500 that's a huge improvement in the flux without without sacrificing the sodium sulfate rejection and we also we also employed this membrane for other salts and you can see that the membrane which we made have a very good salt rejection for even sodium chloride because the cough layer is hydrophilic so it can attract the water more so it can also facilitate the water transport but at the same time it can reduce it can reject the salts now uh, the last part of the presentation is emerging materials for membranes and this is a very popular topic uh, these days in the membrane society so the first one we all have heard a lot about graphene oxide or GO. But today I will also introduce cough and conjugated or graphene oxide. It's actually a modified form of graphene. And it has many oxide groups such as carboxylate, hydroxyl, epoxy, many groups. So it can give us 
tremendous opportunity to functionalize graphene oxide nanosheets with functional groups of our from this memory related into nanosheets so you can reassemble them Uh, this is just a, a diagram of a geo membrane. So here you can see that they are, is, this is an ECM image, that they are staked on one or another one. And if we can, if, and if we can represent it, how it works. So two geo layers, there is a gap between two geo layers. So the water passes through their geo layer. As you can see, this is a very tortuous or long pathway so the geo people say that it can offer a permeance of more than 2000 but currently it can offer us between 50 to 20 so it's far far below than its potential flux or permeance because of this tortuous pathway the geo sheets have no pores so one way to increase the flux or permeance will be to make pore in these geo sheets and the solvent relies on this tortuous pathway so it will take time it means the flux or permeance is low how people have tried to enhance the flux by creating pores or increasing the interlayer distance but if you increase the interlayer distance then maybe the flux is higher but the rejection or the selectivity will be sacrificed the other problem with the geo membrane is that you can stake them in a membrane form through vacuum. But once you put this membrane in the aqueous solution, these geo nano sheets can unstake and they can re, uh, re, how to say, re-dissolve in the aqueous solution. So this is also a big problem with the geo membranes. Oh, uh, I introduced geo membrane because one of my work um, was to mix cough with geo that's why i introduced geo so that you are able to 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 so that you, you you are able to be clear about why i uh, i did this so the cough is another form of how to say crystalline material they have intrinsic porosity it means when you make it they already have pores inside unlike geo the pore size is tunable you can difficult to make a pure cough membrane in literature there are four or five reports of pure cough membrane Now I will introduce a few works which, which was done by me or our, in our group and um, then we will wrap up this presentation. So this is a very recent uh, work of mine and we made this membrane that it's a new technique called solid vapor interfacial polymerization. So it has, this technique has been used before for the, <laughs> for the graphene oxide single layer or the cough single layer, but not for the membranes. So what kind of challenges we address in this? To make a cough, I, sorry, in the beginning, in the introduction, I forgot a few other challenges. So far, the synthesis of cough takes around 72 hours, minimum of 72 hours to make to synthesize cough powders and the crystallinity of the cough is very important because it shows the orderliness, orderliness of the pores so 
in 72 hours we get cough in this work what we did we did a few things first we made highly crystalline membrane so not the cough but the membrane in nine hours and the thickness is 120 nanometer before me the reports the thickness was four micrometer five micrometer in some cases even 700 micrometer a cough membrane so this was the first time that we could achieve such small thickness of a membrane and also just in nine hours so how we achieved it we we used as i said this solid vapor so people used the liquid liquid interfacial polymerization or the salvothermal in that case everything is liquid <clears throat> so as we all know that the diffusion rate of liquid molecule is much lower than the diffusion rate of the vapor molecules because vapor molecules have high kinetic energy and because of the high kinetic energy it can penetrate it can react it can polymerize very quickly so the cough the synthesis of cough is a two two-step process that's what we discovered in this paper that it's a two-step process the first step is polymerization and the second step is rearrangement of the molecules to make it crystalline so if the polymerization process can be accelerated the crystallization process will be accelerated so even in one hour we could get a little bit of crystallinity from this cough but at nine hours, the, 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 the crystallinity of our cough membrane was comparable to the powder of cough, which is made in 72 hours. So this is how we did. We pour one monomer on the silica disc. This monomer is, in, in the literature, it's called TP. So it's 135 triformyl fluoroglucinol and the monomer in the vapors is paradiaminobenzene how we choose these monomers the melting point of the tp is 201 whereas the melting point of the pda monomer is 139 so we have to grow the the, the monomer with high melting point on the disc because the temperature we used here is 150 degrees centigrade so if we use PDA on this disc, then before 150 is achieved, this monomer will, will melt and maybe evaporate. So we cannot achieve the solid vapor interfacial polymerization. So one monomer is on this disc, the other monomer comes in the vapor phase, in the vapor phase with a very high kinetic energy and it can do the polymerization within a few minutes and then the crystallization within a few hours. Then, because this disc is a silica, silicon dioxide disc, so we first grow membrane on this disc, and then we put this disc along with membrane in the HF solution. Be careful, it's very dangerous. As you all know, hydrofluoric acid solution, it can be very dangerous if it touches your skin. So uh, we use very dilute HF aqua solution, and in about 10 to 12 hours, the membrane is separated from the disc so now this is a freestanding membrane and the freestanding membrane have these ordered pores now we just transfer this membrane into a ptfe support and use this as such for the nano filtration experiments and this is what we think the reaction happened so on the disc before this tp we grow APTS. This TFP reacts with the amine group and it makes an aliphatic shift base reaction. This reaction, this bond is not so strong. So, when an aromatic amine comes in contact with this, um, with this support or disc, it can replace or it can break the weak aliphatic shift base bond and make a stronger shape based bond which is which is which is how to say um, synergistic with the 
with this double bond i forgot the real word in chemistry i'm sorry but you understand what i mean so this is just an ex just a comparison in nine hours we get this crystallinity people do this um, in 72 hours and powders not membrane remember this is a membrane this is powder powder are useless for the separation purposes membrane we have used this membrane for the separation and as you can see that our membrane is stable in water and our membrane is stable in organic solvent so the our cough the membrane which we made this cough membrane it's multi-purpose we can use it in organic solvent nano filtration we can also use it in the aqueous separation so the flux rather permeans not the flux the, the permeance of this membrane is extremely high for a c2 nitrile it's 4589 extremely high now if we separated different dyes with this membrane and as you can see that most of the dyes they can be separated except orange because the the size of orange is too small and it's smaller then the pore size of our membrane so some of it can be retained some of it goes through and as i said in the beginning that long term durability is important so we use 30 cycles of this membrane so how we did we we do a dye rejection then for one hour then we purify we we we, we separate pure, pure water in this for 30 minutes then again dye then water this cycle for 30 times we did this and as you can see that the rejection remains steady there is a little bit of the decline in flux but that doesn't matter because the decline is very very low usually the two-dimensional membranes because of the pressure it squeezes down and the rejection uh, is uh, remains same but the flux declines up to 50 percent in our cases because the pores are very ordered so it did not decline the flux remained almost same from 411 it came to 403 which is not a big deal so if we compare this work with the previous literature the first one is our work and you can see that all the organic solvents as well as water our flux is much higher than the previous literatures now uh, the topic was cough mixed matrix membrane so the pure cough membrane synthesis of pure cough membrane is extremely challenging and it's very difficult so people rather do it do mixed matrix membrane so they mix cough powder or cough nano sheets with other membrane forming material and they make a mixed matrix membrane so i have also tried two methods one i i reacted cough nano sheets with polyamide and in the other work i reacted cough nano sheets with graphene oxide so this in this work we increased the permeance of the polyamide membrane by enhancing compatibility between filler and pa those people who are working in the mixed matrix membrane they know that the compatibility of filler material with the polymer forming material is very important. If they are compatible, you can incorporate more filler in the polymer matrix. More filler means more pores, means high flux. And I will explain in the next slide that we also reduced the rate of piperazine in the aqueous, uh, from aqueous to organic phase because it makes hydrogen bonding. The cough nano sheets makes hydrogen bonding with the piperazine. So here, we also, this is a freestanding membrane. So in the aqueous phase, we have piperazine and cough nano sheets, and they make hydrogen bonding. When in the aqueous phase, when the trimethyl chloride comes from top in the organic solvent, it all moves up and the reaction happens on the interface what we do what we get we get a membrane not the polyamide but how to say polyamide cough membrane 
the role of cough is very important because first of all it's hydrophilic next it has pores so what we got that without the cough the flux was 6.8 or the permeals but at five percent of the cough concentration the flux enhanced to 45.6 which is almost seven times higher than the pristine polyamide membrane but look at the sodium sulfate rejection it is unchanged so it means that in this case the cough pores are not aligned vertically but the coughs is spread in the membrane matrix so it the pores only facilitate solvent transport but most of the rejection is done by the polyamide. So this way we could get the maximum potential of cough in the polyamide matrix. So the rejection is done by polyamide, whereas the transport of solvent is done by the cough. Here it's the pristine cough membrane, but once, sorry, not the pristine cough, this is wrong, sorry. This is not PA cough, but it is only the PA membrane. Sorry for my mistake. So this is only PA membrane. As you can see, it's just a plain flat membrane. But when we incorporate cough nano sheets, you can see that there are wrinkles. So if there is more wrinkles, it means more surface area available for the aqueous solution. If more surface area is available for the aqueous solution, more water can be in contact with the membrane surface and the flux can be enhanced. And when we increase the cough concentration, those wrinkles intensity increases. So at PA cough five, which means 5% of cough compared to the piperazine, we could achieve the 45 permeans, which is in itself a big deal. So the AFM images, they are in accordance with the ECM images. Now in another work, uh, we chemically cross-linked the cough nanosheets with the graphene oxide. So as I, I told you before, that graphene oxide has many uh, oxide groups such as hydroxyl, epoxy, and carboxylic. Uh, in, the, in the GO sheets, it is well established that the carb COOH group, carboxylic group, is on the edges, whereas the epoxy and hydroxyl groups are on the periphery uh, on the surface of the GO. So what we did because we made a cough, we made cough, then we chemically exfoliated into nano sheets. Those nano sheets had amine group, NH2 group. So it's a very easy reaction, NH2 with the carboxylic acid group. They react very easily in the presence of a clicking agent. So the geomembrane, we already said it has low flux. The pathway is tortuous, but the geo has excellent mechanical strength. So the mechanical strength of geomembrane is uncomparable. On the other hand, the cough nanosheets, I'm not talking about the cough, pure cough membrane, but the cough nanosheets. If you assemble the cough nanosheets into a membrane form, although it has high pore density, but it has poor membrane forming ability. So we thought how to combine the good properties of GO and cough. And we chemically cross-linked the GO with the cough. Now the cough has pores. It reacts with the GO, the carboxylic, especially the carboxylic acid of the GO, and it makes like a bond. So we call it mixed nanosheet as the title suggests mixed nanosheet so mixed nanosheet is one sheet is from geo for example and one we cannot quantify it but i'm just saying one is from geo one is from cough so this i already explained the path is quite long but once we chemically cross-link these two sheets and assemble them in a membrane now we can see that there is a vertical pathway so instead of going through this way, it can come directly. And here we obtained a very big difference in the flux. So without cough, the, the black line is the permeance. 
the red, it, it, these are the uh, rejection of dyes. So without cough, the permeance around 16 and the dyes rejection is around at above 95. When we increase the concentration of cough up to even 3%, the flux does not increase too much because the main, the main transportation is still governed by the tortuous interspace of GO. But once we increase the cough concentration to four, four here doesn't mean 4%, here it means 40 to 60. So 60% of GO, 40% of cough it starts increasing and at 50-50%, the flux is 226. So from 16, it reaches to 226, but you can see the dye rejection doesn't change. It means that the vertical pores arranged by cough in the GO staked membrane is of immense usefulness. The other problem, as I said, of geomembrane is that they are not stable in the aqueous solution. So they can delaminate, but because there is cough now, so cough is very stable. So this stability, we did it in the sonication bath. And as you can see that at even pH 1.5, even 7, even 11, at all three pH, on right side, these are the geomembranes without the, uh, the cough. But once the cough is added, because of the reactivity, the stability of this membrane also increases. And after sonication, you can see there are no pores. So the membrane are still intact at different pH. And a lot of time, eight minutes of sonication is a lot of time. But the membrane which we made was still stable. This is the last of the, of the titles and I will go it through it very fast because uh, people are not still using conjugated microporous polymers or CMPs for the membranes. Uh, it's good to make a membrane but the synthesis is very complicated and people are now concentrating more on cough. Just to remind you that when I joined this group, nobody was working on cough. And now 90% of our students are working on cough membranes. So cough is a hot topic these days. So it is how to, CMPs is an analog of the coughs, but only non-crystalline. So their structure, their chemical structure, not the physical structure. The chemical structure is very similar, but coughs are crystalline. So it has ordered pores, whereas CMPs, they have uniform pores, but not ordered. So this is one of our work uh, which was published in Nature Chemistry and here we made a CMP membrane. This membrane has a rigid skeleton. So compared to polyamide membrane which, which is network based, this is a framework membrane. Because of the rigid skeleton, it is very ideal for the organic solvent nanofiltration, OSM. So first we uh, functionalize the surface with silica. Uh, sorry, the silica surface was fun functionalized with bromobenzene. Then we grow CMP on this um, bromobenzene functionalized silica, silicon dioxide su uh, support. Then because the membrane is very thin, so if we dissolve the silicon dioxide directly in HF solution, the membrane uh, disintegrates into pieces. So remember, this is one way. In the future, maybe you will need this. This is a very easy trick. So you just need to spin coat PMMS solution on this thin membrane, and then you can use HF solution. So once the HF solution, uh, once the silicon dioxide layer is dissolved, you will get a freestanding membrane of your material plus the PMMA. PMMA can be very easily removed by putting this membrane in either acetone or dichloromethane. So this is, th this is one of the CMP we made. And you can see that most of the organic solvents have a very high flux, as well as the dye rejection is very good. So the red line is the permeate, whereas the black line is field. 
I, I will go fast now, maybe because I took a lot of time. So this is the last paper which I'm going to present. This is also a CMP. We made a thiophene based CMP. So thiophene can give you opportunity to oxidize it. So be, before oxidation and after oxidation, you can see that the molecular weight cutoff of, uh, of this CMP membrane before was 800, but after oxidation, it became 500 because the pore was shrinked. The red line is the oxidized CMP and the blue line is the non-oxidized CMP. And you can see the difference. So the rejection increases. Here it's around 70% of the same CMP, but non-oxidized. The oxidized one, the CMP, the, the rejection is more than 90%. And this is one is the feed, one is the permeate from the non-oxidized, and one is the uh, permeate from the oxidized uh, CMP. So in the summary, polyamide membranes have network structure, and they are already uh, in the application of reverse osmosis or desalination. So they are working at their maximum potential already. Framework materials, on the other hand, such as MOF, COF, CMPs, MZINs, they are quite new and it provides us huge opportunities of research and further exploration. And anything, if, if you do a little bit improvement in the PA membrane, the, how to say, let's be selfish. So the paper or the research article will be, will be published in not a big journal. But if you do a little improvement in the framework material membranes, the, um, the opportunity of publishing it in a high impact factor journal is quite high. But that's because the pure framework membrane synthesis is quite challenging. So people usually do or incorporate them in the membrane farming material to make a mixed matrix membranes to achieve the maximum potential of framework materials. Thank you. If you have any questions.